Welcome into the Sports Buffoons Podcast. Welcome on in, ladies and gentlemen, to the Sports Buffoon Studios over here in Overland Park, Kansas. This is Mike Settle here running the show along with Tanner Dawson. What's up, man? What's going on, everybody? Oh, did you crack that open because it's Cinco de Mayo? Because it is Cinco de Mayo. Oh, very I special. love your outfit. You really oh, yeah. put it all together very this nice. time. Yeah, I got the sombrero going on with the Chiefs, and I got my poncho. I mean, I got this from Mexico, so you know, might as well bust it out for a special occasion like this. You so. might as well. Yeah. If you guys are following us along here on YouTube, on Twitch, or along on Facebook as well, you guys can see our uh, video feed coming through. Otherwise, if you're on Spotify, thank you very much. I love all of you out there as well. So, um, Tanner, uh, what do you? Anything else in store for Cinco de Mayo? Are you gonna have some tacos tonight, or what are you doing? Actually, uh, we had some chimichangas through the air fryer tonight, and that was uh, spectacular, like always. Does that like cut down on like half the calories or something? I don't know. I don't know. It's. I think it's like less. I don't know, what is it, less grease, less something? I don't, I don't exactly know the whole deal, but it, the air fryer is a life changer. Yeah, so. I've heard people like talk about wings being better in an air fryer, or at least different. Is mm-hmm. that true? Yep, yep. Hmm. So even like chicken nuggets, frozen chicken nuggets, world's different from an oven to an air fryer. Hmm, very interesting. I need to check that. I need to get on the air fryer game. Like I'm just, I'm still got like George Foreman's and like now, now don't pots. you can't go cheap on the air fryer though. You got to go like legit legit price like don't don't buy the cheap stuff it's not as great mm-hmm. we had a cheap air fryer for probably the first couple of years and then we got this new one that was more expensive world's difference world's difference so there is a difference in the air fryers yes do not go cheap on your air fryer according to tanner here so, so just i'll less take alert. his word for it on that but I had a little bit of chips and queso. That's about all I had today. There you go. But then again, yeah. I have chips and queso like every week lately. So, <laughs> yeah, my girlfriend and I love uh, Jose Peppers and chips and queso. So that seems to be like a weekly thing. I don't. We need to like cut that out. That's actually, fair, man. It's a little out of control. The cheesy lifestyle we live. <laughs> Speaking of cheesy, was there any uh, draft classes you noticed for the NFL draft this past week? that looked like it was a little runny because I don't know. I, th- I thought that there was some out there that were sloppy draft classes for a lot of teams like. Did you guys notice the Houston Texans, who didn't have a first or second round pick for that matter, ended up getting quarterback Davis Mills out of Stanford, and then Nico Collins, wide receiver from Michigan, and then Brevin Jordan later on. But like, that's a weak that's class so for weak. a week. But they team. also gave away all the draft picks prior to this year, so they didn't mm-hmm. really have a lot of draft picks to work with or early draft picks. It's right? already a bad team. Yeah, and you already you lost all your good players essentially. You don't even know if Deshaun's even eligible to play yet. With everything going on this off season, like yeah. I, I don't mind that quarterback he, that he they got from Stanford, dog. but like they they didn't get anything. They they did not yeah. fill a single hole on their team. No. Well, if you guys listened to uh, my show actually from the weekend, I gave a little recap of the Chiefs draft class and some of my thoughts on uh, the ways that it's going to help this team for the future as well as present. But uh, I was also very curious to see some of your thoughts, Tanner, about the draft classes we saw, anyone that stood out, or uh, especially in the AFC West, if there was any team's class that you thought did a great job. There was a couple of ones that stood out to me. I thought Denver did a good job yeah, overall. Yeah, I thought, I thought uh, Denver Chargers did a did great well job. Too. Chargers, mm-hmm. right? Chargers had a great – I thought they they might have been one of, the, one of the teams to actually win the draft. Just the way they drafted, they got up, they got the players they wanted, they put protection around Herbert, um, and got him some weapons, and they improved the defense all uh, in the same draft. So I liked a lot of their picks. Um, I think Denver made the, uh, uh, what do you want to say, smart move by going cornerback first instead of jumping to an offensive player, but that's also well, I think Sertan is a sure thing. I think, like, I think Sertan's going to be, be good great player. for them. He might be the next champ Bailey for them, so... Uh, which is exactly what they need for that defense to prosper once again. Um, but, you know, it's uh, – I don't know. The Raiders, like, do we even – I don't know what They, they reached for Leatherwood. Like, they reached well, for big Leatherwood. Big time, big time, yes. Who was a second-round pick, not a first-round pick. And there were so many other players on the board that you could have 
Jenkins was still on the board. Mm-hmm. He would have been a better pick, yeah. I thought. So, yeah. I don't know. The Raiders... Willard could have been a second-round pick, I think, in most yeah. cases. Now, the Raiders have had... They got some good people in the past, right? The past couple of years. They do have some good players. But this year, man, I'm, I'm questioning exactly what they were thinking back there in Mayock. Yeah, I, I'm a big Mike Mayock fan, but, like, as Raiders GM, I have not seen him, like, blow me away by any of his draft no. classes. So, I'm cool with that, obviously. I mean... Being uh, Chiefs fans as we are, we, we like seeing the Raiders fail and struggle, you know, all the time. So I'm cool with that, um, you know, forever, really. Yeah, I, 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 not, I have not it. missed them not being in the playoffs or being involved in the playoffs for the last, you know, 20 years or so. So I'm pretty cool with that. Uh, yeah, I thought the Chargers did a good job. I, I like the pick out the second round, Asante Samuel Jr. Mm-hmm. Uh, their first pick was Rayshon Slater, the off- off- offensive tackle for Northwestern. And then they got Josh Palmer from Tennessee. Mm-hmm. So I liked all three of those picks of the Chargers. I think the I love the Slater pick good. the most. I, I just think mm-hmm. where they got him is is one of the probably one of the biggest steals of the draft because he should have been gone long ago from the Chargers. Do you have a winner of the draft? Do you think of what team? I do actually. It is not in the AFC West at all. Um, and the Chiefs could be contending. Chargers could contend. I think the Bears actually. Chicago Bears had a pretty secretly great draft mm-hmm. um, for what they did. They went up and they got the players that they wanted. They were aggressive as well, so they traded up for Josh. Or sorry, Josh. Wow, Justin Fields at pick eleven. Uh, I mean, they they gave up next year first rounder for for Justin. So uh, I thought that was a great trade up as well because that's exactly what they need. They need somebody who can captain and also be. Uh, what do you say, a mobile quarterback, mm-hmm. right? A mobile guy that can also produce a run. I just hope they give him enough talent around him where he doesn't fail, you well, know? And I, I think they will. I, I, th- I like the – I mean, they don't have bad offensive players. They don't have the greatest line in the world. But, man, they just – I'm thinking Nagy is now on the aggressive mode, kind of like Alex Smith was when Mahomes came into play. And this might be a thing. Andy Dalton will start the season – but I don't think he'll last the season. I think you're going to see Fields a lot earlier than we all anticipate. Um, they also traded up again to pick up Tevin Jenkins at pick 39, uh, who for some reason lasted that long. But I thought that was a great trade up. Go get their guy again. And then uh, kind of another guy that um, that they picked uh, at 217 in the sixth round from Virginia Tech is Khalil Herbert. He is a former Jayhawk as well. Uh, he was here his freshman and sophomore year at the Jayhawks uh, two years before, and then Puka came into play, and then he uh, redshirted and then transferred to Virginia Tech. And he he always had solid numbers as a Jayhawk. Uh, so he had he had first freshman year, right? You don't get a lot of carries, 4.3 yards per carry. Uh, for freshman, 5.5 yards per carry in the sophomore. He went up redshirted and then last year he ranked fourth in uh, fbs with a 7.7 yards per rush which is pretty good uh fifth uh with a eight sorry eight well, 1182 rushing yards and then he was seventh in all-purpose yards per per game at 162.8 so i think he's kind of a steal for that backfield um that they did get damien williams but you could look at possibly montgomery or even cohen uh, being trade bait this year with uh, with that pick right there, and then of course they did get up and uh, got Daz Newsom, wide receiver from UNC. He's a he'll be a slot specialist, also special teams depth right there. Um, the guy is quick, he's very fast, uh, but he's also a very tough player. Kind of like I I, I kind of compare him to almost a Tyreek Hill tough because he is not afraid to go up that middle and take those shots, and he goes up and gets the ball. So I think uh, I I think though it wasn't bad. Bad draft for uh, the Bears at all. They went up. They got their guys, and they were really aggressive on trying to get weapons as well. I don't think I would want any former Jayhawks Tanner. So hey, I know running tra- backs always the best. I mean, who's the li- right? I mean, Akita Leib. Historically, well, that's a cornerback. Right? Well, yeah, he keeps Leib. Is that the last relevant Jayhawk in the NFL? Um, he might be actually. No, I it thought was- there was one guy after that. Uh, he played for the Chargers. Oh, you had Chris Harris. Well, yeah, we had Chris he, he turned out okay. So, but yeah, it's I don't know. I, I liked Kelly Herbert. I was sad to see him go, but obviously he continued to prosper, you know, or prosper and train, and he really exceeded expectations last year as well. So, props to him and props to the Bears for picking up a good depth guy. Yeah, that's also just a sixth round pick too. Yeah, I know for me the the draft that stood out the most to me was definitely the Carolina Panthers. 
I liked everything they did from the beginning. Uh, J.C. Horn was their first pick, cornerback of South Carolina. Then they got Terrace Marshall from LSU at pick 59 right after Kansas City went. Uh, then they took Brady Christensen, the OT from BYU. Tommy Trimble, the tight end. And then Chubba, is it Chubba Hubbard? Chubba, Chubba Hubbard. Chubba Hubbard, the running back from Oklahoma <laughs> State. That Those first five picks I think are great. Like You're going to have at least a couple of those guys really come out and be productive. So, uh, yeah, I thought that they came away real strong at that. And I like both their top two picks. Horn and Marshall, I think, are going to be productive players oh, in the league. I, I think they will, too. They're, those so, are solid picks. Yeah, those were definitely – my uh, my that was definitely my favorite draft class. The Chiefs did a great job, I thought, oh, overall you. addressing really every need on the roster. Uh, I know, big obviously, guy. with our first pick, went ahead and took Nick Bolton out of out of Mizzou, linebacker. He's going to be in the middle, getting lots of playing time this yes. year in year one. The Chiefs were weak in that area. They needed to add something. Damian Wilson obviously is now gone. He left the team in free agency, and then uh, the offensive line is going to be ridiculous this year. After Re- having, restructured, re- like, right, yeah. oh my lord! Everything. Did you see how many? When you even when you add in Duvernay Tardif, and then you add in Lucas Nyang, we have like eight different newcomers on the offensive line, yes. and all of them are Maulers. And so adding Creed Humphrey in the second round, I thought was perfect. Uh, rookie center that's going to come in, I think, could start from day one. Obviously, it's going to be a competition, but it seems to me, besides a couple spots, every spot along the old line right now is a competition. So, oh, like, the, you um, can't keep everybody, obviously. So you're going to see some of these guys go, right? Because you can't keep yeah, that whole We're going to have depth guys. this year no matter what. Yeah. So that's something the Chiefs have always lacked is having offensive line depth. And this year it's going to be a thing. We're, we're going to have a guy that could be a starter on a different team actually being the Chiefs' backup offensive lineman, it's which crazy. is something we're not used to. <laughs> Normally the Chiefs have had you know at least above average starters, but then if someone was to get injured, then it was oh, going to be a disaster. Man. And it proved to be true in the Super Bowl considering just, they had we four – backups starting along the offensive line in the Super Bowl. Right, so. and I, I don't think it's going to be necessarily uh, a bad thing to have because the depth, you're going to have depth that also position. You're not going to have to have a guy go from right tackle to left tackle this year or left to right, or even either way, right? You're not going to be able to have that. You're not going to have to find a guard to go play tackle. You're going to actually have depth at the tackle position, depth in the guard position, and depth at center. So I think that's going to be a huge win all the way around, especially after this draft. Yeah, I was thinking about that, too. I mean, obviously we saw Patrick Mahomes struggle in that Super Bowl scrambling. He actually, you know, scrambled for what we, what we saw. It was about 500 yards behind the line of scrimmage. Mm-hmm. He was the most pressured quarterback in Super Bowl history. and uh, But they did not add a whole lot of weapons this offseason for the receiver position. No. Obviously, Sammy Watkins is gone. They ended up drafting wide receiver Cornell Powell uh, out of Clemson. A guy who really is a redshirt senior, didn't get a lot of playing time due to injuries until his red, until his senior season, and then put up productive numbers with a team over 800 yards receiving and seven touchdowns. And then a tight end adding a guy like Noah Gray is Noah great. Gray. Um, I think the Chiefs finally might have a legitimate backup tight end to go behind Kelsey. Yeah, so He can easily take over that two spot too. Oh, easily. Easily. The guys back there right now are, are a disaster. So. And the, the guy, Noah Gray, is actually built really well. Yeah. Um, kind of. He's uh, athletic. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I'm not going to say call him a Travis Kelsey, but he is a athletic guy who could probably complement Kelsey very well mm-hmm. in the passing game and also in the blocking game as well. I hope so. I think I think that was a great pick and potential steal there in the fifth round. So yeah, he ran like a four five four five five was his forty yard time, which is super quick for you know a tight yeah, end. Obviously, that's quick. That's a good time. He, I think he's going to be a good you know pass catching well, option. Even you know Andy Reid and Veach, they go out and get they get these weapons, and they're not just going to get any weapon. They're going to get guys that can make a difference. So obviously Noah Gray was somebody that Reid, and I'm, I'm going to say Reid because Reid's Reid needs another tight end, and I think Reid went out there talked to Patrick Holmes, probably even got with Kelsey a little bit, and says, "Hey, what do you think?" I think I'm going to take this guy here, and it's, I think it's going to work out. Yeah, the only question mark, I think, at this point for the Chiefs, the offense right now could be right tackle. I think that's something that it could be up for debate, whether Mike Rimmer mm-hmm. starts, whether it's Lucas Nying, or somebody else can step up and take over that position. It remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um, but otherwise, I think the other four spots on the O-line right now look terrific, and I'm not really, I don't really care who you plug in there. I think they're going to be productive. I think they're going to be Between Joe Tooney right. and Orlando Brown, Jr., um, and then Duvernay Tardif is back with the team. You know, one of these guys, obviously, I think Tardif has a chance potentially to not even make the team somehow. That's what I was thinking. I'm serious. I was thinking maybe him and even Blythe. 
um, would be which, the who two. was just signed. Yeah, obviously. which we just signed, but I, 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 there's a chance that those two may not even make it onto the the final roster. Yeah, do you think that the Chiefs did enough for Patrick Mahomes this off season to where he can go in and be comfortable and calm and not be scrambling for his life and also have enough weapons in the passing game now to be productive coming into 2021 season? Yeah, I think I think I think Veach did a hell of a job uh, taking care of Patrick Mahomes this off season. Obviously, you bulk up the the depth of the line that we just talked about. You bring Orlando Brown Jr. in, left tackle. The guy is I, if you haven't seen his size yet, the guy is a monster, and he didn't allow any sacks uh, all last year, which is really impressive for an NFL. Um, but then you got guys returning off of uh, fresh years, right? Tardif, who struggled with injuries uh, in 19, was off last year, right, helping out with the COVID situation. So the guy's healthy. The guy's coming in healthy. That's going to be great for the line. It's going to be great for the line. Lucas Niang coming in, stepping in. We got some rookies, some young guys. Uh, I think that's great, and I think on tight end, running back, we're both set. We signed Jer- uh is it Jarek McKissen? Jarek Jer- McKinnon. McKinnon, McKinnon, uh, to uh, to a deal, and he's a, a great pass catching running back as well. So I think the depth for our running backs are set. Uh, we got monsters at the tight end position now, finally, and uh, wide receiver. You know, I'm actually not too worried about it. I think allowing all, everything that has happened for Patrick Mahomes and the O-line to allow him to give him time and hopefully even bulk up that running game as well to be able to do that play action a little bit more and be more effective. Um, I think you're really looking at a uh, developing wide receiver squad squad that Patrick Mahomes can develop. And Jody Fortson could be a guy that comes out of nowhere next year. Yeah. So you might I yeah. keep an eye out. He he connected really well with Mahomes uh, two years ago. So I think uh, I, I'd be I'd be excited for that. Um, so I think you're gonna see some some new names, some uh, some some different. Uh, I don't want to say depth depth chart, right? So you're gonna see a lot of guys that try to fill that two spot. But I think Patrick Mahomes will make everybody a two spot scatter around for the three three guys there at the two spot. Of course, Tyreek Hill will be one. So I'm I'm super excited. I think Vich did a hell of a job uh, this off season so far, and I'm I'm sure he's not done. I'm sure he has plenty more moves up his sleeve, but I, I don't think the guy's done yet. I wouldn't mind one more move for a veteran receiver, just for the sake of adding depth, and that way, in case of an injury, you know, to someone like Tyree Kill, then yeah. they still have someone there that can be a leg- legitimate option that's been in the league long enough, knows how to play the game, obviously. Um, but otherwise, I think everything else on the offense right now looks terrific. Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, the running back, you know, adding McKinnon obviously has a bad injury history, but when he is on the field, he's pretty productive. Um, like you said, good pass catching running back. So, he's someone that can be effective. The Lions, by the way, did wave carry on Johnson. So, he's someone who will be on the market from the looks of it. So, uh, you know, obviously the Chiefs have Clyde Edwards Hilaire, and that's the number one back on the team right now. But with the way the team is structured, it's good to have a change of pace back. It's good to have other guys to be able to come in. And Daryl Williams did a good job with that, too. So got to yeah. give him a lot of props throughout the season. There's a, there's a lot of guys possibly on the trade market as well that we may or may not know could happen, right? A Julio Jones, a Zach Ertz could come into play. Um, there was a, a, the Dallas wide receiver. Um, who the, Do you remember – Who's the name of the Dallas wide receiver that's like the big star outside of uh, Amari Cooper? Outside of Amari Cooper? Yeah, outside right of Amari. Oh, you're just talking about from Oklahoma last year? The, the rookie? No, not not the rookie. Uh, he didn't. I can't remember his name now. Hold on. I'm going to look it up while you keep talking. Because yeah. he's a potential well, trade bait as well. Yeah, there, I mean, there's options out there, obviously. But I just think that there's probably going to be some availability somewhere along the line where you can add a veteran receiver and. Uh, you know, someone to come in, if in case of an injury, obviously. Oh, yeah. That's something that needs to be addressed still, in my opinion. is Because I wouldn't trust looking at the roster. If Tyreek Kill was to be injured this year, which he, he does get nicked up every once in a while, obviously. And then you look along, we got Demarcus Robinson and Byron Pringle and Hardman mm-hmm. as their starters. I don't know. That doesn't oh, sound good to me. Gallup. That's who it is. Michael Gallup. So there's yeah. a chance for him to be available. And he, he actually could be a really good complement for this offense, so. Yeah, he's look he's looking like the odd man out over there just because of the way that team has too many weapons right now. I no, think. they they got tons of weapons. They don't right even now. know what to do with everybody at this point. Exactly. But exactly. I agree with that. You know, this past weekend, Tanner, I went to it was my second ever NASCAR race over at the Kansas Speedway. 
Yeah. And, uh, and it was pretty fun. It was awesome. Uh, Kyle Bush ended up winning at the Bushy McBush 400. Um, I'm just like, you know what? Is this like staged? Is this like pro wrestling? Because, you know, what are the odds that we go over there? And uh, we had, we actually had Bush Light at NASCAR. Okay. And okay. then Good. there's Bush, Bushy McBush 400 and Kyle Bush wins. Like, I don't know. You know what's crazy? Kyle Bush went on his birthday. And it was his birthday. That's true. And it was yeah. the first win of his of the twenty one season for him. So yeah, it was his first of the, of the season. I'll, you know, <laughs> this this makes me think that whenever the Undertaker went undefeated at WrestleMania for so long, that you know that wasn't real, because you know I, I feel like he really won all those matches and you know his. Oh, fight. I think so. Yeah, none of it was staged. No. But you know, whenever I see NASCAR do those kind of things, I don't know. He got buried alive too, and you and know. he came back from death at many one point, times. You know, actually. So. I don't know. I know the first time I ever went to NASCAR was the SpongeBob 400, I believe is what it was called. And uh, that was interesting. Um, the SpongeBob, I, I guess it was like to draw kids to want to hang out at a NASCAR race. I don't know. Uh, that one got rained out. So uh, we weren't <laughs> under the sea, but, you know, we were still getting wet. Um, so that one was not as fun because it got rained out or delayed. And then I walked over to Target and then was like, all right, I'm good. And so this one was way more fun. Yeah. So like, what was, was like no what, delays. What was your favorite experience of it? I guess going for the first one. From oh, for, oh just being from, able to from this first time. Be there the, the whole experience from the idea of pulling up and like hanging out tailgating for a little bit, and you know obviously I haven't tailgated in uh, over a year. Right. And so that was nice just to hang out and play some cornhole, meet some people next to us that from out of town, and um, then uh, just kind of listen. You know we had we had radio plugs that we were doing while we were watching the race and. Not a whole lot happened. The Spe- Kansas Speedway is a pretty boring and generic track yeah. compared to most. Um, but nothing really happened until the very end, and then everyone starts wrecking. And so then there's a bunch of cautions, and then there's a bunch of, you know, just people start getting a little more anxious towards the end of the race, I guess, and it's start nothing uh, trying to make things anything, happen. So. But, yeah, no, and I, did you understand anything about the race going on? Let me ask you that part. That's what I want to know. Like, were yeah. you catching on, like, certain things i've been watching nascar tanner you know almost every sunday for the past eight months when it's been on okay. and so you know watching nascar is nothing new to me now um i haven't missed a race at all this year and uh, last year i was watching towards the back end of the season before chase elliott ended up winning the the cup um at the end and then this year only one guy has won two races so far um out of i think they've done 11 races now and um it Gosh, I don't know why he's blanking right now. <laughs> his, his, his name is erasing my mind at the moment for some reason. Um, well, but I'm only one, only one guy's uh, won two so far this year, which is, I guess, great because you're getting a lot of different faces out there every single week. My girlfriend would kill me right now if she's listening. So, yeah, it's actually her favorite driver. But he's, he's good. I don't know why my, I'm just not I'm having one of those moments. Too many things going on at once because Hunter Dozier just hit a bomb to the moon, according to Royals Twitter. So... That's good to see him it's start about to come time. So I'm glad about that. I mean, the Royals obviously have been struggling. Uh, that has not been a good thing, but they've lost three in a row, currently playing right now uh, against the Indians. But um, I think the main thing with the Royals right now in general is just the relief pitching is struggling so much, and that seems to be the biggest problem because I think the offense is still fine. It just comes down to relief pitching being an issue. And, uh, Which is odd. It really, uh, to me, it's I'm, really I'm odd. Surprised. I think that the relief pitching is a problem personally on the team. Um, Greg Holland, you know, has not been good. Um, no, and most saying. guys they brought in. I do I like Josh, Josh Stallmont's been good, but a lot of the guys they bring in after the starters come out or just come in right away and screw things up. And I thought the opening uh, of Daniel Lynch in the major leagues was nice. I thought he looked pretty good. He only, I think, allowed one run when he was in. Mm-hmm. He ended up getting pulled, I think, right before five innings. And then at that point, relief pitching gave up the rest. The, the Royals ended up losing that game 6-8 uh, to eight on Monday. And uh, so the, the, the amount of runs given up, though, you're not going to win. Because the last three games, they've given up 13, 8, and 7. And so you're just not going to win games in baseball, giving up that many, that many runs. So oh. they got to get back to the basics on pitching and just figure out ways to hold the other team down. You're not going to get wins in baseball when you're walking people, when you're giving people free bases, and then they capitalize on those runs, right? So it's not necessarily just uh, – what, what do I want to say? Not necessarily just uh, bad pitching. It's giving away free bases. And I'm not just talking about the pitchers. I'm talking about the defense too. Giving up those errors. You're giving up more runs. 
you're causing those pitchers have to work harder than they should. Um, so real quick here, for free bases, guys, so far this year, 112 total walks, 112 total take your base, right? That's from the total pitching staff. Now, from the bullpen alone, there's 65, 65 free bases. You are in that Major League Baseball, and you're sitting here walking people. Get out of here. Like, that's just, that's how you lose games. That's why you go from first to last. And we are in the month of May, people. The Royals do not like to perform in the month of May. I don't know if you're aware of this, but every May, I'm pretty sure we calculate maybe three to five wins. And this is not good because we are sitting at first place right now. Uh, I think we're actually a game, still a game up from the White Sox, but we're not. We may not be there much longer if we're struggling like this. Yes, we have Jesse Hunt on. Uh, he's on uh, IL as long as with uh, Zimmer. So hopefully you get a couple of those guys back soon. Uh, and then Mondesi is also starting uh, starting his rehab and getting things ready, so he could be back here by June. But guys, we got to clean that up. We get. We can't be doing. 65 free bases on the relief team. Come on. And then 20 errors in the field, Mike. Let yeah, me tell lot. you that. That's not been good. That's 20 errors. And guess what? Four by Nicky Lopez. Yes. Three by Merrifield. Those guys lead the team in errors. Yeah, we expect Merrifield a lot normally more. pretty solid. I think he went through a little phase where he was tripping up, but mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I think the, I, across the board, they got to do better. I, I think defending. this is our issue, right? We're producing offense. We are producing games that we should win when you score six runs you should be winning those games you don't win those games when you're giving up walks when you're giving up errors you're giving hey you know just going to take your base like if you look at the earned runs so like keller right keller only had two earned runs in his loss it's because he had errors from dozier they gave he gave up too many walks right after that like it's 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 not clean we got to clean stuff up and i think i think we're we're going to do that but it's going to be a struggle. We got to figure out our guys as well down in the minors. Like, hey, we got to get some people going. If these guys aren't, if these guys are going to continue to, to go, we get we got to figure something out here. Uh, and then, really quick here, um, a tweet from Sean Newberg or Newkirk at Sean Core. Uh, really weird that the Royals bull, 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 bullpen has stunk with a 35 year old, a 35 year old, a 38 year old. A guy with a career 6.82 walks per nine, a guy with a career 4.85 walks per nine, and a guy with a career 6.51 walks per nine in the minors. Are you kidding me right now? This is the people you're putting out there? We we got to clean some stuff up, man. We yeah, got to clean it up. I, I totally agree with that for sure. Um, I, by the way, the, the, the driver was uh, Martin Truex Jr. Martin Truex. That was the one I was trying to think of a little bit ago. <laughs> so um, just wanted to clarify that. He's the only one that's gotten two wins so far in NASCAR. So, oh, nice. Um, he ended up not finishing particularly close on the Sunday at the Speedway. But, I mean, I, I don't know if this is sustainable. Sitting here right now with the Royals at 16 and 12, obviously no longer the best team in baseball statistically or standings-wise. Uh, but still about 500, which is great. And I think that they've shown flashes of potential. And I do still I'm going to stick by my word and say this is an 85-win team, like I've said all along. Um, but I do, at, this, at this rate, with that kind of relief, the way that they're going at this at this time, I don't know that they're going to be sustainable going forward if this is the way it's going to be for the rest of the 130 games. Um, so I mean, obviously it's a lot to clean up at this point. Yeah. So. I, th- I think they fix out their pitching. I think we'll be fine. Ben Attendee has been on fire. Um, and Dozier's coming around. In his like last I said, four games, Dozier would come around. He's, he's and batting 538 his last four games. Our, our offense is playing great. we got to clean up our defense and pitching, man. Huh. And then do you think the bring the bringing back, you know, eventually of Raul Mondesi, do you think that's going to, or I should say, Alberto Mondesi, is that going to be an effect on the offense and defense? I think it'll be, yeah, I think it'll be a big effect on the offense. The guy plays spectacular defense, and then you're going to see a lot more uh, steals with Mondesi as well. The guy's really aggressive. He's really fast on the bases, and he's actually secretly powerful, uh, especially when he's hitting. So, I think him coming back is going to be huge for the team, and it's going to be a great uplift for them as well. Well, I am hoping they get a turnaround here soon because the beginning of the year it's been fun to watch the Royals games, but you know when you're watching a game, a tight game, and then relief pitching gives up you know three runs in the eighth inning, that's not fun. So no. at that point, it ruins like, the game. What are we doing here? You know. So Tanner, we have if you're so if you're sitting here watching us here on YouTube, 
Uh, we got our hashtag Dogecoin up right now, actually. So we do. <laughs> you're a Dogecoin holder. How many Doges do you have, Tanner? Oh, let me take a look here. It's not very much. I mean, not as much as uh, you, but... I don't have that many anymore. We're looking at... I, I got 188. Okay. 188, 188. Dogecoins. I'm a poor guy. So. What, did you, what did you think about the, the story coming out of the Oakland A's now accepting Dogecoin as payment, and they've actually already had fans buy... 100 Dogecoin gets you two seats for the entire series over the weekend. That's a hell of a deal. I think that's a hell of a deal. I mean, right now it is. Dogecoin might be worth, you know, five bucks. I mean, you're, uh, you're not per, even paying that much coin to be able to, to actually U.S. dollar-wise. So, right. yeah, that's... As of right now, that's great value for the fan. I mean, mm -hmm. go online, purchase 100 Dogecoin, which would cost you right now uh, about 50 bucks, a little over 50 bucks right now for 100 Dogecoin, and then uh, turn that into a whole series a whole series yeah. with two tickets at, at, over a weekend at a baseball game in California. I mean, in California. <laughs> now those those Doge coins, you know, some people believe are going to go up over time to turn into you know three dollars, four dollars, oh, yeah. five dollars. Some crazy people out there say you know a hundred dollars per coin, which would be nuts. But um, I, I personally don't know if that's possible. I don't really think it is. But um, so Tanner, is Doge coin going to the moon? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think it's been steadily going to the moon. Um, I kind of like what we got coming up here. Um, obviously, you follow a lot of it, so I listen to what you say. So. That's true. But I don't, the no I, I don't do too much of my own research. You know, I, I throw in what I can and let it ride, baby. Just let it ride. It's like a, it's like playing a game of roulette. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't think you have to worry too much about losing much on it because it's got the backing of the people. I mean, if the people like it, it's going to stick around. And I think it's got enough of a like a fan base, basically, that people are just supportive of making this a cryptocurrency of the world. And, you know, backers like Elon Musk and Mark Cuban said a lot of good things. We have guys out there like Meek Mill putting 50 grand in there. Um, obviously, there's billionaires involved with Dogecoin. It's actually worth more now than Ford, uh, Honda. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's got a lot of value at this point, just Dogecoin in general. It's got a lot of people out there with a lot of money put into it. So. Yeah, and we talked about it a few times on the show towards the end. So, um, you know, if you guys, hopefully you guys listened in and kind of did your own research about that because it's, it's increased quite a lot. A lot more movement the last uh, week than it has probably the last – three or four years it's fun to watch actually tanner i went out to dinner yesterday with the girl and uh the waiter saw me on my phone looking at my robin hood account <laughs> and he comes up and he's like do you have dogecoin and so the waiter himself was just super excited uh, to talk about so he and i talked about cryptocurrencies <laughs> for an hour you're making friends because you're on your robin hood app in the yeah. middle of dinner he sees my app open and starts talking about it yeah, we talked for we ended up talking for it was probably half an hour to be honest but we just talked and talked and talked, and oh we went on. I went on about Ethereum Classic, and went on about Bitcoin forever, and all kinds of other stuff. So sure, you're talking about your videos that you watch and all that, like yeah, yeah man. Uh, well, it was it was fun, but yeah, it's it's cool, like seeing the people being believers of the doggy. So obviously, <laughs> Elon Musk will be on Saturday Night Live on, on Saturday, Saturday Night Live uh, coming up, and he's hinted rumors he might have a skit about Dogecoin. Yep. And so, Tanner, what if the skit is this? Somehow he's been given the privilege to announce that Dogecoin's accepted by Amazon as payment. Or Tesla. Or oh you can buy Tesla my. with Dogecoin. Now, that would be amazing. If you announce that live on SNL, that you'll take Dogecoin as payment for Teslas or, you know, whatever. Like, yeah, I feel like the value is going to skyrocket. And skyrocket very quickly, too. Because we already have a lot of people, a lot of, you know, big businesses. I, there's a lot of talks, a lot of Twitter talk. Everybody on Twitter is all about it. Um, there is a lot of skeptics as well, right? But I mean, there's I see a lot more Doge support than I do uh, skeptics talk. So, like yeah. this this thing is just in the beginning stages, I think. I hope it's around for a long time. You know, I don't know what the value is going to go up to over time, but I just hope it sticks around. I hope it's legitimate. You know, we have it. You know, in our lives mm -hmm. for the next fifty years. So we will see and what comes of that. And I would say hold on to your Doges and uh, see what it turns into at this point. But That's right. Never know. Um, well, we're going to have a part two actually with you guys here in just a moment. But so if you guys want to stick around if you're following along on YouTube, we will come right back. But for this show, or at least this half of the show, then we're going to wrap up here and we will hit on a few more topics in the next one here in a few minutes. But uh, Tanner, any final words to the end of this one? No, no. Let's say let's keep it going though. This is a great conversation here. We got a lot of good chats going on here. 
Uh, JG, as you see, is not with us today or here that he's not with us. He is in our YouTube chat. So if you do want to give him a yell real quick, hop in YouTube and give him a chat here. So If, you, if you've noticed, we've not been saying any cuss words on the show this time. Because um, we're the... Jason got us listed as explicit on Spotify. Jason gets overexcited, all right? He gets, just gets yeah. overexcited mm-hmm. on some stuff. And he's that's been all told, right, though. He's passionate. He's been told before as sitting at a Baccarat table, no F-bomb, no F-bomb. <laughs> because he gets too carried away. People got to tell him, no F-bomb, no F-bomb. Um, so otherwise, you know, he causes trouble. So, so yeah. um, If you're he, following right now, hop on YouTube real quick, guys, and he'll be on there to chat with you. Yep. And uh, so for this one, I will see you all on the next one, guys. We'll see you guys.